close our time together this week, and we've basically kind of been looking at some perspective on the Laodicean message, and specifically how we view ourselves and our experience with God. And so we talked Friday evening about um, what motivates us. What is it that motivates you, right? And this morning we talked about not forgetting where you came from, and I'm going to close today with something that may freak out some of the staff, but I assure you I'm not going to lead these youngins astray, how to lose the kingdom. This is not one of those like five-point messages and how to be lost. I, <laughs> it's not, not like that. There's really basically two points. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, um, yeah, I've, I've had this sermon on my heart for a while, and I'm really, really excited for it. I've never preached it in my life, so if it's terrible, just blame me uh, and not God, and I hope I don't go long. Those are the two things I'm a little worried about. But I trust Jesus, and you're in for a blessing, I think. So let's pray to ensure that that happens. God in heaven, I thank you for this privilege to come into your presence in prayer. Lord, I thank you that you've been with us last night and this morning, and I'm trusting that you who have brought us this far will continue with us. So we just pray for your presence, for your blessing, and that we would not soon forget the blessing we receive just now. Send your spirit to do what I cannot, I pray. And I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, how to lose the kingdom. And someone remind me, I need to make an announcement at the end of this message. So, if I don't make the announcement, it's your fault and not mine. Okay? Great. Moving on. So, what I'd like to do is cover a contrast between the life of King Saul and David. Because there's a, we got one big fan in the room, all right, and I, it, I think it's very fascinating. I think there's some profound lessons on righteousness by faith, for one, but two, you just look at the two lives of these guys, and, and if you compare the sins of David and compare the sins of Saul, David's life is an absolute dumpster fire in comparison to Saul, and yet Saul ends up lost. How does this happen? What is it that led to this tragic result in the life of Saul? And I think we can learn a lot from it. And so let's begin with King Saul. So in 1 Samuel chapter 10, if you'd turn with me there, we're going to have a Bible study this evening. I hope you're okay with that. If you're not, too bad, because that's where we're going. 1 Samuel chapter 10. It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath, I hear. Bible study sounds pretty good. 1 Samuel chapter 10. And we're just going to walk through the experience of Saul and start connecting some dots. 1 Samuel 10, beginning in verse 6, says the Spirit... So whenever Saul is chosen and Samuel's communicating with him, he says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with him and be turned into another man. And let it be that when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. Then go down to verse 9. So it was that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another what? another heart. And he literally has an encounter with the new covenant. Now, what is this new covenant? Well, in the faith I live by 111, something I made my juniors memorize, but I don't have juniors here anymore because I left. Um, But something you should know, the faith I live by 111 gives a great definition. She says, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. And when men see their nothingness, then they're prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So, righteousness by faith is God doing for you what you can't do for yourself, but you need to confess your nothingness, your inability to do for yourself what you can't do, right? So that's the first. In Ezekiel chapter 36, God makes this extravagant promise to the Israelites He says, I'm going to bring you into your own land. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And then he says, I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And then I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34 alludes to something very similar. He says, I'm going to to write my law in your heart and in your mind. And he says, your sins and your lawless deeds I will remember no more. This is a beautiful promise of God in the new covenant for believers, right? Whenever we come to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
What we see in the experience of Saul is somewhat similar. He's given a new heart, and the Spirit of God comes into his life, and it literally gives him this holy boldness, as we're going to see. Uh, it actually happens in 1 Samuel 11, that some people are doing some stuff towards the Israelites, and Saul's like, what, what is this nonsense? And he says, let's go get busy and take care of work, and they do. And they end up beating the bad guys and whatever. But this holy boldness comes upon him when he encounters the Spirit of God and is given a new heart. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13, it starts to get ugly. And beginning of verse 8 says, he was going to war. Samuel told him, I'll be there in seven days. The problem is it looks scary and no one's showing up and he's getting kind of freaked. The people are starting to leave. And so he's feeling like he needs to do for the people uh, and for himself what Samuel promised to do on behalf of God, right? So he tries to make himself and the people right with God by making his own sacrifice. Samuel said, wait here for seven days. I'll take care of it. Yeah, but Samuel isn't coming, and so I'll just do it, right? Instead of following the clear call of God, I'll do for me and I'll do for the people what God said that he would do. And it doesn't turn out well. It was a direct violation of God's counsel, and then he tries to justify himself when confronted. This is where it gets, this is literally one of my funniest moments, I think, in Scripture. He says, And he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Actually, it's not this one. It's another occasion that's the funny one. But anyway, Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I've not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, You've done what? Foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established the kingdom, your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. It's of great importance, young people, that when God asks things of us, we do them. Not because God says, do it or else, and because I said so. He only asks us to do things. How do I phrase this? There's like this really awesome thing. The only things that God asks of us to do are the things that we ourselves would choose to do if we knew what he knew. The only things that God asks us to do are what we ourselves would choose to do if we knew what he knew. That's it. It's not legalism. It's not control. He's just doing what we would have wanted him to do if we knew that ahead of time. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and it's even more important for leaders specifically, right? People mess up, stuff happens. Confess your sin, come back to God. But when leaders defy the command of God, it has a far more dramatic impact upon the people, right? With Moses' situation of saying, hitting the rock twice instead of once and saying, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Claiming a prerogative of God. Because was Moses capable of bringing water out of a rock? No, but he was claiming something that God was meant uh, to do for the people. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning in verse 8, he's told, this is the one where it gets a little humorous, um, he's told, whenever you go and fight the king of Agag, you need to wipe everything out. Everything. The whole place is gross. It's filled with potential for evil. It needs to be stopped. And so in verses 8 and 9, it says, He also took Agag, king of the Am Amalekites, alive, so he didn't kill him. And he utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to dis utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. So did they follow the command of God then? No, they didn't do all that he asked. So then we get to verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Ouch. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord, how long? All night. 
So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself and has gone on around, passed by and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Did he? No. <laughs> it gets worse. He says, But Samuel said, Really? Well, uh, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? I think it's hilarious. I did everything God said. Oh, really? What's with this barnyard of foolishness I'm hearing over here? Because they're not supposed to be here, right? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we've utterly destroyed. In short, I know that God said we shouldn't do this, but look, we're just going to do things our own way, but we're still going to worship God with it, right? So we're going to redefine God's terms and conditions and just do it our way and try to get away with it. It didn't work too well. And then Samuel said, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? When Saul was first selected, he was shoulders above anybody else, right? Whenever Saul stood, everyone else only came to his shoulder. But when he's called by God and they're going through the process of casting lots to find out where they are, they can't find Saul because he was small in his own eyes. He hid in a corner. He didn't feel worthy to lead the people of God. But now that he gets power, he now thinks that he can do whatever he wants and that God will just go along with him. He forgot where he came from. Yeah? Yeah? Big time. He says, when you were small in your little, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they're consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel, or then Saul keeps justifying himself. He says, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission to which the Lord sent me. And I brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, right? I did what I should have done. And then he confesses that he didn't do what he should have done by keeping Agag alive. And it was the people's fault that they brought all this stuff, right? All these animals. Um, the best of the things so they should offer them to the Lord. Samuel says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed better than that of the fat of rams. We need to understand this morning, young people, that just doing stuff that we think we ought to do, you know, in our own way, we'll just try it this way, that's not what God is looking for. What God is looking for is your complete heart, right? Not on our terms and conditions and most of the way or whatever. God just wants you and all of you. And don't think that you can just you know, do some other deeds to try to appease God while doing your own thing. That's not what he wants. It was never about the stuff. It was about you, right? That's what God has always wanted. It's you and it's all of you. And he said, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. That's what we've been looking for all along. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Not a good trait of a leader. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And he says, no, I'm not going with you. Um, and it continues. He says, I'm not going with you. Um, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And we're about to find out that this was not a genuine repentance from, from Saul, unfortunately. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe. That's actually what this slide is here. He seizes the edge of his robe and it tears. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. And also, yeah, that's a good way to get at somebody's pride. It's even worse for Nebuchadnezzar. A kingdom inferior to yours is coming next. But anyway, he says, And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. 
He's literally saying, no, 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 I don't want these people to think bad of me right now. I don't want them to see me getting in trouble. Just make it look okay. So do you think his, his repentance a couple sentences ago was re, like legitimate then? No. He just wants to get out of trouble, right? He just wants to get out of a whooping. He's not really contrite. And then go to verses 34 and 35. Then Samuel went to Ramon, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel went no more to see Saul till the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Not a pretty story, is it? This guy that was favored in the land of Israel, who was given a new heart, the Spirit of God was placed within him, but he wanted to do things his way, and he wouldn't take responsibility whenever he messed up. He was too proud to take responsibility. This is what's referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 10, as worldly sorrow. He says that godly sorrow produces repentance, and a repentance that doesn't need to be repented of. But worldly sorrow produces death. Worldly sorrow is, I don't want to get a whooping, I'm sorry, let's just not talk about this anymore. Godly sorrow is a genuine recognition that you have wronged, that you've wronged people, that you've wronged God, and you want a change of course. You understand the difference? Saul refused to take responsibility. He refused to follow the leading of God, and he wanted to do things his way, right? I thank you, God, for leading us this far, but I'll take over. I know what I'm doing. I'll take over from here. So if you want to lose the kingdom, young people, that's a good place to start. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God does move on to someone else, and it's the story of David being anointed king. Uh, we're just going to leave it at that bullet point. But in verse 7, God doesn't work the way that we work because whenever Samuel gets there, he thinks, oh, this guy's tall and good looking. It's him, right? He says, no, not that one. Well, what about this one? Nope. That one? No. All right, what about the least of this group of guys I see here? Mm -mm, not them either. Hey, Jesse, do you, do you have any other kids? I mean, yeah, I've got my son out there taking care of sheep. That's him. That's the one I'm looking for. I want that one. He's a man after my own heart. God's ways are not like ours. He looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And it's a good principle for us in choosing leadership and spouses. Not that God's going to give you somebody you're not attracted to. Don't worry about that. I assure you he will. But just if all we're looking at is, hey, he's good looking. I hope he's spiritual. And if not, maybe he will be because I'll read the Bible and stuff right? No, we need to look at the heart. We need to know what the trajectory of this person's heart is. And again, don't freak out, young people. I promise you, God will bring you someone you're attracted to. Promise you. All right. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Same situation as Saul, isn't it? The Spirit of God comes upon him. He gives the man a new heart. He again has this um, new covenant experience just like Saul did. But his is, is a little more, it, it, it sticks for him. Now, the significance of him having the Spirit in his life continues. And we see this, that even in David's prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, I believe it's in verse, I'm not even going to guess. We're just, I'm just going to go cheat. I'll be right back. He says in verse 11, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. David realized how desperately dependent he was upon the Spirit of God to do anything right. Right? Remember, when men see their nothingness, then they're prepared to receive the righteousness of Christ. Right? And so Saul never understood his dependence upon the Spirit of God. He thought it was based upon what he did. That's why he thought, well, no, I can keep all these things and disobey God, and I'll just do some deeds of religion, and God will be okay with me. He, under, he misunderstood how the kingdom operates, and he wasn't even faithful in that, let's just be honest. Saul picked and chose how he would obey God, and that got him in trouble. Now, in verse 14, it's very interesting, because in verse 13, it says that the Spirit enters David, but look what it says in verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Oh, that's loud. So verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit came upon him and troubled him. Now, it's very interesting to me because when this spirit of distress comes upon him, the spirit of darkness and spiritual oppression, right? When dark spirits are oppressing Saul, who is it that ends up coming to help him in the midst of his oppression? David. When David, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, plays music for him, 
it brings relief to Saul who's being oppressed, right? And I find it very interesting that the spirit that enters David is the one that ministers to Saul. And I almost wonder if it was just this, this continual reminder to Saul that if you would confess your sins, you could have this. You could come back. And Saul never understood that, even though it was right in his midst. He never understood it. Instead, he was jealous of David instead of recognizing that David has what he lost. You understand the difference? He lost a blessing in that. Now, in chapter 16 and verse 18, it says that one of the servants answered and said, Look, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing. He's a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. It was known that the Lord was with David, even as a young man. Now, in, verse, in chapter 17, it's a story of David and Goliath, and that same spirit of boldness that was in Saul in 1 Samuel 11, I believe, yeah, in verses 4 to 7, is found in David. And he says, you got to be kidding me. You guys are afraid of this one guy? Doesn't the battle belong to the Lord? Look, I'll go fight him. Just imagine this stripling here is going to go fight this big, gnarly guy. And everyone thinks, you're out of your mind, man. But how does it go? And round and round and round and round and round, right? It, he eventually comes tumbling down. Um, Goliath. I didn't learn that growing up because I was baptized at 25, but I've seen my friends with kids do it, and I kind of liked it. Anyway, they, they sang it at church like two weeks ago, and I actually knew all the words. I was like, wow, it's amazing. So anyway, in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 12, Saul's afraid of David because the Spirit left him and was in David. Then go to 1 Samuel chapter 23. This is, this is terrifying. Um, actually, I'm just going to summarize this for time's sake too. But Saul has fallen so far from God that when he's pursuing David to kill him, right? He tried to pin him to the wall at the dinner table. Hope that doesn't happen at your house. And it happens twice. He's running from him. David's running from Saul. Once David gets help from one of the priests and, and Saul finds out about this, he's fallen so far from God. A man who encountered the new covenant, right? God gave him a new heart, put the spirit of God within him. That same guy now goes and kills priests of God in his pursuit of David. He's fallen from grace dramatically and devastatingly. In chapter 24 uh, and in chapter 26, he gives a false, short-lived repentance when encountering the goodness of David, right? David, he's in a cave. Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself, and David goes up and cuts a corner of his robe off, and whenever Saul goes out of the cave and goes a far distance away, David comes out and says, what are you doing, man? Like, what have I done to you that you're pursuing me like this? I've done nothing to you. And then he holds up the corner of his robe. And then Saul repents and says, you're a better man than I am. I'm sorry. You can come back now. I'm not going to pursue you anymore. It doesn't last. And it happens again. This time, David comes from the mountaintop down into the camp. Saul's sleeping. All of his men are sleeping. And they take a spear and a water jug. And David's mighty men, one of them that's with him, says, look, just give me one, just give me one jab with this thing and he's not going to rise again. Just let me take care of this guy and get rid of him. He says, no. You will not lift your hand against the anointed of the Lord. He goes up to the mountain, and then he starts yelling at one of Saul's armor bearers and says, you deserve to die because men were in the camp and you didn't protect the king. And then Saul says, is that you, my son, David? My son, huh? Is that you, my son, David? And he says, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pursue you anymore. David knows better. But the point is, he has two forms of repentance, of taking responsibility, but it doesn't really matter when you don't mean it. When you don't really want to take responsibility, it doesn't do any good. The lip service isn't what's looked for. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it says that the goodness of God leads to repentance. And that's kind of what was happening with him, but it wasn't a genuine repentance. The goodness of David led him to try to take responsibility, didn't really go over. It's a worldly sorrow that leads to death, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7. In 1 Samuel 28, Saul is seeking an answer from God. The Philistines are coming after them. He's horrified. He's seeking an answer of God, but God won't answer him because he has rejected God. He won't do what God is asking. He won't listen to him. And he doesn't even want the answer that God would give him if he did answer, which is why God can't, right? If you're not going to do what he wants, he can't answer you. And if you're not going to listen to him and heed him and go where he's leading, it does him no good. And he ends up running to spiritualism of all things, the very thing that he told people they would die if they did in his nation, according to the laws of Moses. 
He runs to spiritualism to meet his need, and it, it doesn't get much better from there. He eventually dies. Here's the point, young people. When Saul was confronted with his sins, he refused to take responsibility. He made excuses. He justified himself. And when he would repent, many times it was just to get out of trouble. That is not taking responsibility. He lost sight of his nothingness and his need of the Savior and his spirit, and it cost him the kingdom. But this is not just a message for our young people. This is a message for all of us. Because it's very easy when you're in a position of responsibility, either as a parent, as a teacher, as a mentor, as an administrator, as a department head, whatever you may be, it's very easy for us when confronted with something that we do wrong to just move on as if nothing happened and try to do better instead of taking responsibility. And what we lose sight of is that there's a blessing in taking responsibility, and we're going to go into that. Now, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, the whole incident with Bathsheba happens, which, by the way, nothing in the text implies that that was a two parties both wanting this to happen incident. In fact, um, oh, what is his name? Uh, he's written the love song for the Sabbath. Dr. Uh, no one knows. He said Andrew's really smart guy. Davidson, I think. Dr. Richard Davidson has written an article on this that's pretty fascinating, making it clear that this was not a consensual thing at all, actually. It was a power play by David, and she just had to, to go along. Um, the point is, when David is in this situation, he forgets where he came from, right? He's walking on the rooftops. He's not with the men in the, in the battle that he ought to be, and he ends up doing something absolutely horrible in this situation. And what ends up happening in chapter 12 is that Nathan tells a parable to him, and he says, there was this guy, there's this sheep, he has a little lamb, it was like his own child, and then there's this other guy, he has all kinds of stuff, and whenever he has a guest come in, he goes and takes the little lamb from this guy, and, he, and he, he kills it and does it for this other guy. And David is livid. He says, that absolutely not. That man must die, and he must die now. And what does Nathan say? You're the man. He's not saying, you're the man, David. You're right, I'm the man. That's not what he's saying, right? You are the man. You're the one who's done this. And listen to what happens here. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Look at how David responds. 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 7. He says, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You've taken his wife to be your wife, and you've killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you've despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel before the sun. And listen to how David responds in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. The big difference here, people, is that David actually sees what he did. He takes responsibility when he messes up. And that changes everything. God is willing to take us back. He's wanting to take us back. But if we don't take responsibility, right? It says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's more than willing to do that. But if we're too proud and stubborn to acknowledge our sins, God can't do his part. You with me? It causes a lot of problems. But he says, I've sinned, and listen to how David and Nathan responds immediately. He says, the Lord also has put away your sin, and you shall not die. You can be forgiven. There's going to be consequences. There are always consequences for sin, always. But you will be saved, right? There's good news for us in the story of this. Because he took responsibility, he confessed his sin, didn't run from it, didn't make excuses, didn't try to justify himself. He owned it like a man. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, Abigail, David and his men are out and doing their thing, and Nabal has men and sheep and flocks, and David's men are like a wall of protection around all these folks. They have needs, and so he says, hey, would you give us some food? And Nabal says, who's the son of Jesse that I should care? Right? I don't want anything to do with this guy. 
and he's just a drunk and he's a deadbeat. His wife says as much. And what ends up happening is she gets word that David and his men are about to come to that house and just get busy, right? They got swords. They're going to go to town. And David's not acting wisely here. He's not acting judiciously here. What ends up happening is the Spirit of God comes upon Abigail, and she comes out and she brings all these offerings, right? Figs and all kinds of stuff. She brings food for the men and does what her husband would not. She's having to take responsibility for her husband because he's a scallywag, right? And so she comes out, she takes responsibility, she appeases David, and listen to how David responds whenever he's confronted. This is Second Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 25. Something tells me that word's going to be circulated around campus in new ways. Already has. Already has. All right, then. That's old hat. We're well past that one. All right. So then David said to Abigail, after she, she gives him this kind of like veiled rebuke that you don't want to have this blood in your hands and you're acting unwisely. She literally tells him this and David takes it. Doesn't get chippy. Doesn't get proud. Listen to what he says in verse 32. He says, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you, because you've kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself on my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who had kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought to him and said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I've heeded your voice and respected your person." And then if you go to verse 20, uh, 39, David, when he heard that Nabal had dropped dead, he says that blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. David literally acknowledges and confesses what I was going to do was evil. And God in his mercy spared me from that and he praises God for it. Again, he acknowledges and confesses how he had messed up. And God blesses him for this. Now, I'd like to look at the hall of shame. I'd like to look at some lame responses in Scripture of people who, when confronted with their sins, did not take responsibility. Adam and Eve. Adam says, "Uh, no, 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 it's your fault because you gave her to me, right? Is it true that you ate of this fruit? This woman who you gave me, she gave it to me. When he asked the woman, she says, this snake that you made, right? He started talking and doing his smooth stuff, and I, yeah. But again, they're not really taking responsibility. They're blaming each other. They're casting the blame elsewhere. They're not acknowledging. They're not confessing, right? Aaron, this is, this is rather hilarious, really. Moses comes down after he sees the madness that happens. He breaks the tablets. And when he gets to the base of the mountain, and, and Moses goes to Aaron, he says, What are you thinking, man? And Aaron's response is literally, Well, I, I, I took all this gold, and I threw it in the fire, and, and, and this calf came out. <laughs> really? I don't think so, right? It doesn't get much better than that. Uh, you get the story of Balaam, right? Balaam is riding this donkey, and then he starts cursing at the, at the donkey and arguing with an animal, right? The very donkey that came to visit us today at lunch. Just imagine if it started talking to you. It'd be like, oh, wow, wow, right? That's, that's pretty amazing. He doesn't think that at all. He just gets mad at the donkey and then says, why are you abusing me? Have I ever done anything like this to you? Have I, have I ever not done what you've needed me to do in the past? Uh, that's true. Hmm, right? Uh, Nabal, again, who's the son of Jesse that I should care? And then his wife ends up taking responsibility for him because he's a scallywag. Exactly. Sorry, staff. Jonah. Jonah, whenever he's rebuked by God, he's really frustrated because... You know, the, the, I wanted this place to burn. Like you said that you're, I don't want to come here because I know that you're good. And I, I'm going to look stupid when I tell these people the place is going to burn because I know that you're good and you're probably going to love them. And so whenever God, this vine grows and it shields him from the heat. And when the vine withers away, he says, what right have you to be angry? I have every right to be angry just, just because, right? Doesn't take responsibility. I even used emojis for this one because this is my favorite. I've obeyed the Lord fully, right? I've done everything the Lord has asked. And Samuel basically says, hmm, really? Uh, What's this bleeding of sheep I hear then, right? A refusal to take responsibility. David, when hearing Nathan's story, his is a little better, but it is kind of 
funny to some degree. That man must die. Yeah, so um, about that. That's actually you, right? David did better. I just liked his response. Um, We did that. The Pharisees. Jesus starts writing on the ground, right? And he's writing the sins of the people who are there in front of them. He says, whoever's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And as Jesus starts writing these things, the response of the Pharisees is basically, okay, bye. And then they just walk away, right? They They don't want to deal with that. They don't want to take responsibility. They just leave, right? This is not a good way to do life. This is not at all the way to do life of refusing to confess, refusing to take responsibility. Now, the Hall of Fame, when it comes to taking responsibility, David, in 2 Samuel 11 and Psalm 51 with the Bathsheba situation, he owns it completely. He says, against you, you only have I sinned. He says, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. Take not your spirit from me, right? This is the story we see. And then in 1 Samuel 25 with Abigail, we've already covered these. Next, Peter, whenever he sees the merciful look of Jesus across the courtyard, he weeps bitterly and repents. Just imagine, guys, Jesus, you tell Jesus, I'm never going to fall. Ain't nobody going to fall. Not me. uh -uh. These guys are probably going to blow it, but me, no, never. And Jesus says, before this evening closes, before the rooster crows two times, you're going to deny me. No, I'll never leave you. And then he does it. And at that very moment where he crashes and burns the third time, He hears the rooster crow, and as he looks across the courtyard, guys, he literally makes eye-to-eye contact with Jesus. And you know what he sees? Not condemnation. He sees mercy. He sees compassion in the eyes of Jesus, and it wrecks him. Absolutely wrecks him. And he repents, and he's a new man. Paul, confessing who he was and how he hurt the church in his radical conversion, there's three separate occasions where Paul puts his dirty laundry out there. First in the book of Acts when someone else tells it. But he tells his story two more times in the book of Acts, and he just lays it all out there. He talks about it a lot in his epistles. 1 Timothy 1.13, Philippians 3.6, Acts 29, 9-11, uh, 1 Corinthians, not Corinthians, <laughs> 15, 9. I'll fix that typo right in front of you because I'm going to preach this in Loma Linda in a few weeks and say it again if I'm not careful. That was easy. Okay. Um, well, all right. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, Galatians 1, 13, etc. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel 4. Man, you know you're really taking responsibility when you write a letter and send it to the entire kingdom and tell them how much you messed up, Right? That's a good one. And the ultimate example in the Hall of Fame of taking responsibility is none other than Jesus Christ himself. Jesus committed how many sins in his lifetime? And yet he pays the price for how many sins in the history of earth? All. Jesus is the ultimate example that he takes responsibility for things that he didn't do. The least we can do, young people and staff and visitors and adults and parents and whoever else is in this room The least we can do is take responsibility for what we did do. Are you with me? We can't be too proud to not take responsibility when we mess up. Here's why this matters. The entire sanctuary service was one big act of taking responsibility. It trained the believer to martyr their pride and to take responsibility, right? Whenever you messed up, there were camp, people were camped on the north, the south, the east, and the west. When you messed up, you had to take an animal from your tent and you walked the walk of shame, right? All around the city square, you went down to the tabernacle. And just imagine, when you see somebody walking with their animal, your immediate thought is, Bob sinned. Bob sinned. Mary sinned, Right? So-and-so sinned, and they're on their way to the tabernacle. But the beautiful thing was, what people thought of you didn't really matter in your eyes once you knew that you were right with God. What was more important to you than anything in the sanctuary economy was that I need to be right with God. That's what atonement means, to bring two parties at odds back together. And when they confess their sin over that animal, confession is part of this, at the entrance of the gate... And they themselves had to kill the animal. They had to see that their sin costs something. It costs someone. When they did this, they could go home with peace of mind that they were right with God. The beautiful thing is you today can go home and have peace with God. Amen? 
You can confess the sins that you're cherishing. You can confess to your children that you've not treated them right. You can confess to your wife that you've not been nice. You can confess to your husband you've not been nice. You can own it. You can be right with God. You can be right with your fellow man. We can do that. We can be right with God today. And the sanctuary service is meant to teach us that. The investigative judgment is meant to remind us of the very same thing. God cannot cleanse and remove the sins that we don't confess. The only sin that God can't forgive is the sin that you refuse to confess. But remember, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So it just makes sense that on the day of atonement, the people of God were meant to be searching their own heart. Am I right with God? Am I right with my fellow man? Have I done what I need to do to ensure I'm right with them? And David says in Psalm 51 and verse 4, something very interesting. Psalm 51 and verse 4, in the original language, it reads differently than the book of Psalms does, but Paul picks up on this. In Psalm 51 and verse 4, it says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, when you speak and blameless when you judge. And we think, you know, that because I sinned, God will be blameless when he judges because I messed up. The problem is that's not the way the original language reads at all. If you read in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul actually gives us what it actually says. Uh, it's just a, a translator error. It's not that the original text is faulty. But in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4 in our English versions, when Paul is quoting this, he gets it right. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, he quotes from Psalm 51 and verse 4, and it says that you may be justified by your words and that you may overcome when you are judged. And he's speaking to God. David realized that his sin did not just hurt him, it's hurting God in the investigative judgment. Because we're told in Ephesians that God is making known his wisdom to the onlooking universe and the unfallen worlds through the church. Well, what do you do whenever the church doesn't look like Jesus? You understand? God himself is being judged in the investigative judgment, and what he's seeking to do is to purify people to make them look like him, to vindicate that his plan was right all along. I can transform their lives. I can change them, he says. And this is why he alludes to this in, in verse 4. In Romans 3, in verse 4, he says that you may be found just when you are judged. This is why David says that, you may, that I've sinned against you and you only, right? David was not just trying to get out of trouble, right? He wasn't just looking for ways to get out of trouble. David realized that his sin had hurt God, and that's what gave him that tenacity and that earnestness in his repentance. You understand the difference? He realized that his sin hurt God, not just him. That's how we know his repentance was legit. So our sin needs to be in the sanctuary for it to be covered. That's what the Day of Atonement was meant to be. And we're currently living in the Day of Atonement. If there are things that we realize that, you know, I know that I wronged so-and-so, but I just, I just don't want to own it. You have no idea how liberating it is to just confess, to just take responsibility. It's powerful, young people. There, there are few things you can do in your personal relationships as a parent, as a child, as a teacher, just as a human being, than owning it. It's amazing how quickly that gap can close in a lot of ways and how more quickly healing can come when we just own it. And we'll cover more about that in a moment. In Steps of Christ, chapter, uh, page 38, Ellen White talks about true confession. I, I'm going to read just two paragraphs from this because I don't have a lot of time. Um, she says, True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. There may be of such a nature as to be wrought before God only, and there may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who suffered injury through them. Or they may be of a public character and should be as publicly confessed. But all confessions should be definite and to the point, acknowledging the very sins of which we are guilty. Notice, justifying ourselves is not listed there. Making excuses is not listed there. Avoiding the topic altogether and hoping to get it right in the future is not listed there. You face it head on. In the days of Samuel, the Israelites wandered from God. They were suffering the consequences of sin, for they'd lost their faith in God. They lost their discernment of His power and wisdom to rule the nation, and they lost their confidence in His ability to defend and vindicate His cause. They turned from the great ruler of the universe and desired to be governed as were the nations around them. And before they found peace, they made this definite confession, We have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. 
The very sin of which they were convicted had to be confessed, and their ingratitude oppressed their souls and severed them from God. Um, And she covers more in that chapter. It's an amazing chapter. Now, if there are things that you don't know, we talked about this last time I was here, if there are things that you don't know that you've done, it's kind of hard to confess those. And God actually made provision for this in the sanctuary, in the economy in the sanctuary. There was a morning and an evening sacrifice that covered the unknown sins of the people. That sacrifice still happened on the Day of Atonement. Still happened on the Day of Atonement. Which means that those things are covered, so don't get freaked out. But if you know that there's something that's just not right, why run from it? What benefit do you gain by running from taking responsibility? You gain none. It just causes difficulty. It causes shame and guilt. Our personal lives and relationships, we got to do that, guys. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says if, you, if you're bringing your sacrifice to the altar and realize that someone has something against you, go make it right. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says if something's not going on that, that says it needs to be, you need to go talk to that person one-on-one. You need to take responsibility. If they won't listen, if they won't take responsibility, bring somebody else with you, right? And then bring it before the church. But there's this principle of of having reconciliation one with another built within what God wanted for the people of God. He doesn't want this tension between us. Literally one of the best ways that you can find reconciliation and overcome conflict is to man up and take responsibility. Get over your pride and just do it. I'm telling you, I've seen such a dramatic difference in relationships when I just took the first step to take responsibility. And it wasn't easy. But you'll never believe it. When you muster the guts to do it the first time and you don't die, it's actually just a little bit easier to do it the next time. And when you don't die, it's a little bit easier to do it the next time. And before you know it, God transforms you into the type of person who genuinely takes responsibility. When they realize they messed up, they want to make it right. It changes the way you live and it's so liberating. I cannot tell you how liberating it is. It feels great. It's hard to get over it because we're a stubborn, prideful people. But God in His great love for us is not going to give up. So if you mess up individually, own it individually. If you mess up publicly, own it publicly. Martyr your pride and own it. Take responsibility, confess your sin. Now, I'm not going to go in depth on this for a number of reasons, but there's this amazing video on YouTube right now that's a TED Talk that Joshua Harris has and it's called Strong Enough to be Wrong. And you may agree or disagree with the conclusions that Joshua Harris is coming to in his life right now. That's not my point. If you just listen to the principles this guy covers in his video, it's absolutely amazing. There's a lot of lessons this man has learned in having to come face to face with difficulties that have come from decisions he made. And it's taught him a lot. Really, really helpful. Now, taking responsibility is not only the right thing to do, it's the only pathway to freedom. Are you hearing me? It's the only pathway to freedom. We got to confess, we got to own it, we got to take responsibility. The only sin that God cannot forgive young people is the sin we don't confess. And He's safe. He's shown us this continually throughout Scripture. He loves you. He has no desire for you to die or to be lost. You can come to Him. If there's anybody in the universe that you can confess to safely and not be ashamed or afraid, it's Jesus. He's proven that. You can come to Jesus today. We're missing out when we don't do this. And when we take responsibility, it's actually a reversal of the fall of Adam and Eve. They refuse to take responsibility. It's a great way to reverse the fall. And you can have peace with God today, and you can have peace with the people that you've hurt. You can do it. So, how to lose the kingdom. I want to give you a brief personal testimony. When I was starting to come back, I didn't go looking for God. God came looking for me. But when I started to realize the love that God had for me, and I was starting to respond, one of the most impactful moments of my life that radically changed the trajectory of how I did life happened in the summer of 2005. I had just finished marching my first season of Drum and Bugle Corps as a professional musician. And I came home and my dad sits me down in his bedroom. He sits me down, I don't even know what I sat on, I think on his dresser or something. And my dad sits on the edge of his bed and I kid you not, in tears, the hero of my life, 
the man who saved, Jesus saved my soul, but the man who converted me, my dad, looked me in the eyes and in tears, he confessed to me that he had failed me as a father spiritually. And he asked me to forgive him. And I remember thinking to myself, why is my dad crying? He's been the best dad I ever could have hoped for. Why, why is he crying? It was because he realized once he found Jesus that he had failed me. He had not given me what I needed as a young man spiritually, and he saw the fruit born in my life of not having spiritual leadership. And while my dad saw how he stood with God and his responsibility, he owned it with God, and you know what my dad could have done? He could have just chosen to do better going forward, and I never would have known, but he didn't. He owned it like a man. He looked me in the eyes, and in tears, he told me, Dee, I'm sorry. I failed you as a dad spiritually. Will you forgive me? And is there anything I've done to hurt you? He wanted to know. My dad wanted to be right with me, and I learned a very, very big lesson that day. That's what a man looks like. Men don't run from what they've done. They take responsibility. And young ladies, I'm promising you, if you're looking at men, you want a man that's going to take responsibility. Because you don't want to be like Abigail, where you're, you're married to a scallywag, and you're having to clean up his mess every day. You don't want that. So man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. One of the things you need to be looking for is someone who takes responsibility when they mess up, who realizes, you know, I didn't do right. I want to make it right. Young men, you are not a man until you take responsibility. <laughs> Fathers, you are not a man if you're not taking responsibility with your children and with your wives. Taking responsibility is not just for men, by the way. But the best thing you can do as a person of influence is not be too proud to own it. Own it, and you will be amazed at the respect you're going to receive from your children, from your spouse, from the people in your church, whoever it is, you will be amazed, I assure you. My mistake here, I came to Heritage Academy in the fall of 2012 fully convinced of the fact that I knew what life is about. I got it figured out, and I was very troubled when I came to this place, having come out of the world and having scars in my experience from all the stupid stuff I did before I found Jesus, and I saw young people who had ambitions that were similar to what God called me out of, and my immediate reaction was to slap people and tell them their ambitions were foolish. Now, I didn't hit anybody. Just don't misunderstand me. But I did not understand how to handle the things that I was seeing and, and, and the frustration that I had. I didn't know how to handle discipline, right? I called Ketch out publicly um, in the middle of a worship because Ketch was clowning around during worship. And I thought, this isn't appropriate. You can't do that. And I called him out publicly somehow. I forget how I did it. And he hated me for at least a year and a half, for sure. And, and to some degree, for good reasons, because I did not handle that well at all. You don't call people out publicly. It's not, it's not the way to do it. It just isn't. Right? You can address topics publicly, but you don't call out some person and shame them in front of everybody. God doesn't use shame. Satan uses shame. God doesn't. And I didn't know that. I didn't know any better. I did what my dad did with me. The problem was dad did that with me individually, right? If something wasn't right, he'd say, hey, buddy, this isn't, this isn't okay, right? But I had to do things differently. I had lessons to learn. You'll never believe this. I didn't have everything figured out. I wasn't near as awesome as I thought I was. And I had a lot of growing to do, and I literally killed my ministry with the young people as soon as I got here to a large degree. My ability to be a positive influence to change and to be able to disciple and have these kids trust was greatly hampered because I did things wrong. And it took some time for me to realize what I had done, but once I realized what I did, I had already learned from my dad how you handle things like this. I stood up in a chapel and I owned it in front of all the kids. I took responsibility for messing up, and I took responsibility about the catch thing in front of all the kids publicly. Because I messed up publicly, I owned it publicly. And God began a process of redeeming my ministry here where the children eventually did, the young people, did come to trust me. And it was very difficult for me to leave. Life gets better when you build a pattern of taking responsibility. You don't have that shame, that regret, that tension. It's not there anymore. You can lay your head on your pillow at night and have peace because you're right with your fellow man and you're right with God. Life gets better. 
When Saul was confronted with his sins, he refused to take responsibility. He made excuses. He justified himself. And when he would repent, many times it was just to get out of trouble. That's not taking responsibility at all. He lost sight of his nothingness and his need of the Savior and his spirit, and it cost him the kingdom. Remember, in the faith I live by 111, what is justification by faith? It's the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. And when men see their nothingness, then they're prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And this is why if we confess he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the great news. You messed up. There's a God in heaven who's willing to receive you, but own it. You can confess it's safe, and you can have peace with God tonight, right now. You can begin the process of restoring peace with your fellow man right now. You can do it. By the grace of God, if Jesus took responsibility for things that he didn't do, the least you can do is take responsibility for what you have done. Amen? And by the power of Christ and his strength, he can give you the ability to do so. So I'd like to make an appeal at the close of this weekend. First of all, has this made sense? Yeah? Yeah? I'd like to make an appeal at the close of this weekend because we've been looking through three different aspects of what I believe are kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the Laodicean message, that we're not who we think we are. What is it that motivates you in your religious experience? You just looking to stay out of trouble? You just wanting the good stuff, right? Or is there actually love for Jesus in your heart? This morning, don't forget where you came from. Do you find yourself criticizing how other people give everything for Jesus because it's, it's ugly, it's, it's, it's not pretty, it's not the way that you would do it? Do you find yourself just not really feeling like you need to give God anything? Do you find yourself idle in your Christian experience? It could very well be that you've forgotten where you came from. And the good news is, you can come back. And this evening, we got to take responsibility. We are, we are the people of God, we're the people of the book, and we're living in the midst of the investigative judgment. What better time to take responsibility than now? Why not? Right? We, are to, we are to reflect the character of God to the world. What better way to do so than by being right with God, right with our fellow man, and owning it? Amen? So if, if you realize that I've, I, I'm, I'm poor, I'm naked, I'm miserable, and I'm blind, that I've not fully realized where my heart is in certain areas, and that I need Jesus that I freely confess that I have nothing to offer God but me. I can't just do stuff to get him off my back. It doesn't work that way, right? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Doing religious deeds just to get God to kind of be happy while doing your own thing, that's never what he wanted. What God wants is you. That's all he's asking, you. And you never believe it. When God has you, you start to do the stuff that he asks. And then it makes sense. It's what Lewis R. Walton was talking about Friday night. If you realize that that's you, that I just need to tune up, I need to earnestly reflect upon my own heart, and I want to be right with God. I want to have the right motivations. I don't want to forget where I came from anymore. If that's you, then I just want to invite you to stand this evening, and uh, I'd like to do a closing hymn, uh, Nothing Between. Nothing Between, I think that's what it's called. Three, two, two. Somebody better sing it. It's going to get ugly if I do.
Lord Jesus, we want nothing between us and you. And I just pray, Lord, if there's tension with family members, with spouses, with our children, with our classmates, with our students, Lord, I pray that you would give us Christ's spirit of courage today to own it, to make things right, to reconcile our differences, and to be at peace with God and with man. I ask that you would forgive our sins today, Lord, of pride, of obduracy, of stubbornness. We were told this evening that stubbornness is as the pride of witchcraft. God, I pray that you would set us free from that, that you would break that stronghold in our experience, and that we would find ourselves right with you, right with our fellow man, and ready to give the gospel commission. This is our plea this evening, and we ask this now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hey, I had an announcement. Thanks for reminding me. Beat you to it, but I heard you. Um, so one of the things that we at ARTV are wanting to do is to be in contact with those who have gifts in our church to enable them to succeed, to use them in advancing the work. And even if you aren't someone who has all of your gifts exactly where you'd want them to be right now, we're beginning to develop resources and offer webinars to train you in these different areas because we want to see media used to glorify God and finish the work. If that's something you have interest in, uh, speak to me um, this evening, and I'd like to get some contact information for you to ensure that we can follow up and uh, get resources in your hands, because we'd like to see you using your gifts for the Lord, whether it's on behalf of ARTV and the World Church, or just in your personal ministry, we'd like to help, and we'd like to, to have your involvement. So that's, uh, that's my public service announcement for the evening. Apart from that, I have nothing else. It's time to go to supper now, Jason Sutton says. So if you're feeling hangry, we have a solution. And Miss Miriam has it. Okay, SA, you're going to meet with Miss Miriam doing supper. But she's promised.